Hi everyone, this is Michel Schildmeijer from the Netherlands and I'm presenting for you Replace Docker based containers with CryoCata for better security. I hope you enjoy my session and if you have questions I bet StackConf will give you the facilities to ask questions. I know this is a bit of a weird situation, um, me presenting here from home, but I hope you'll enjoy it and let's start. So first a little bit about myself to introduce myself where my background is well as I already said I'm from Amsterdam the Netherlands actually uh, a small uh, town near to Amsterdam uh, and I'm a so-called lead top technologist uh, working at Qualgy and Qualgy is a consultancy company uh, near to The Hague and we do a lot of technologies uh, we are an Oracle partner we're doing data science we're Java uh, development house uh, and we do uh, managed operations for several customers so for myself um, I started uh, doing IT within uh, 1994 uh, starting with uh, basic Unix uh, where a platform was at that time I tried to support uh, in the pharmacy where I worked at that moment and I make my switch my IT career switch in 2000 starting with uh, BEA middleware technologies application server uh, web logic for instance and um, uh, tuxedo and also of course uh, Oracle databases uh, Unix well Unix uh, operating systems so um, yeah I have a broad knowledge of all these systems uh, through the years and uh, well the last years I also try to focus more on uh, cloud native container native landscaping uh, helping customers in developing a strategy for their future um, IT computer landscape and uh, along with that also uh, work methods like DevOps uh, agile working comes along with it and those are all uh, subjects you take with you but my focus first is uh, technical on the container native uh, technology side so here is a list of topics which I try to cover in this session um, some of them more deeply and some of them more an overview um, so containers and trends the runtimes of containers uh, some container security um, but also the integration with the orchestration tools like Kubernetes and I will give a short demo about how Kata containers work and try to emphasize a bit on the runtime and alternative tools for building uh, and uh, running your containers in a uh, Kata container landscape so if you look at container trends um, well, since the rise of cloud, DevOps and microservices and a lot of new technology trends, also infrastructure has made a major transition in how to build, provision and operate your, um, your infrastructure and your computer landscape. And there's always a need of 24-7, high demands of new and better functionality, uh, release cycles has to go on more frequently and uh, these have all impact on how you design your application slash infrastructure landscape so a transi transitioning of an existing infrastructure is can be real tough to a container based and it's something which has to land and evolve within an organization which is simply not an easy task it, and it usually starts somewhere at a development club which thinks uh, docker containers are easy to manage and to work with and um, from that on it starts more and more to become mature and um, evolve into from uh, all stages to production eventually um, but you have to think of all the benefits with the new way of working and also keep in mind that uh, not only functionality and um, more higher uh, higher release cycles higher demanding of new features are important but also be aware of your security because security is one of the top priorities in the container native landscape and security is always a thing which 
uh, I put it on one in my slide, but it's always a, a topic which comes well somewhere behind whenever where everyone is always already gone, project is already gone, and then you need to consider about uh, security. So in my um, top trends of container native landscape, I put on security at first to think about how you design your container native landscape. And all those others are also extremely important, but for now uh, I emphasize more on the security and government governance. And so to come back to this um, statistics you can see in on my screen, um, Gartner uh, calculated in 2019 that at that moment um, containers, application containers, which were in production, were uh, less than 30%. So that's not even the majority. I know a lot of companies and then a lot of corporates and ent enterprises still have their legacy running uh, usually running on premise and if they go to cloud then usually it's more like a uh, an IS transition first and um, I haven't seen that much application landscapes already moving to the cloud but when you look at 2022 Gartner uh, predicts that it will be more than 75 percent of the container landscape or uh, of the infrastructure landscape will be container native so a container-based application landscape. So it means security is a priority top one. Okay, container technology, what's it all about? Okay, there are a lot of buzzwords uh, these days, um, especially when you look at container technology, cloud enablement, so uh, cloud native applications, um, serverless uh, functions, microservices, low code, a lot of buzzwords. But what do they all mean? It's it's really it can be confusing for uh, for uh, people. Um, maybe you're already uh, totally into uh, container technology, so this slide won't bring you any new. But for the people who are uh, pretty new to it, I will try to explain the differences between all these different uh, approaches of uh, serving infrastructure. So when you look at uh, infrastructure, um, then you have, you can divide it in three major things. First of all, you have uh, your bare metal server and your bare metal server is just uh, uh, a physical server or a farm of physical servers in a data center and they all run their own operating system um, specific for their for that host for that server and they have their own operating system uh, uh, you can install your application on it or the software of your vendor can run the database or a set of databases or an application server on it but that's just it, it it's dedicated for that part for that application no um, um, no sharing between in between of resources so around uh, the 2000s uh, and 90s uh, from the previous century, um, the concept of a virtual machine was introduced. And a virtual machine is actually a virtualized hardware system with, an, with its own uh, operating system. And this operating system can be on top of what's running on the bare metal server. And it's completely isolated. So you don't know in your virtual machine that you are running on a uh, guest uh, host um, and you can run uh, as many virtual machine on this uh, on this uh, server as you wish uh, it de only depends on how many resources you have on your bare metal server if you have enough memory CPU uh, and storage then you can run um, unlimited uh, uh, servers on it virtual machines um, so these virtual machines share some resources from the initial bare metal server. So they get a piece of uh, CPU, they get a piece of storage, they get a piece of networking assigned, um, which comes from the hardware server, but they're completely strictly isolated from each other. So that's the concept of virtual machine. 
Now, some later, uh, at the end of 2009-10, another initiative came up, uh, which was called containers. And containers are actually um, a small set of a configurable unit and a small set of services and applications, uh, different than a virtual machine where your applications are just uh, installed in a virtual server. And in for uh, a container, it, it's, it's just um, a small subset specific for a small application. So no overhead, uh, all kinds of unnecessary software can be removed. Um, so containers can be very lightweighted if you do it in the right way. Uh, they share the operating system kernel. So you can um, install a layer on top of your operating system which translates all the uh, kernel features for your, uh, um, uh, for your containers. Now, uh, different from virtual machines, which uses a hypervisor to translate, uh, uh, to translate the uh, kernel features and operating system features of the host. Uh, in here you have your um, container runtime software. So uh, things are uh, can be isolated, uh, storage and network can be isolated for containers, um, but you share your kernel, and that's the most important thing. Um, a container is an application and infrastructure package as one, which makes it for DevOps teams able to uh, deploy an application, including the infrastructure, so infrastructure as code. So you can, as a DevOps team, your uh, where your responsible for a small part of the uh, of your of the application landscape you can manage your application from dev to prod entirely uh, usually it's packaged in an image and an image is a piece of a bundle of software which uh, 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 has all the things for uh, your application all the uh, the uh, install installables the libraries which are needed for your containerized applications and when you start up a container it runs as a process on your system on your Linux slash maybe a Unix system depends so this concept of containerization is not that new actually it's already since beginning of the 80s uh, where there was some kind of a te container technology uh, only it wasn't implemented uh, at a large scales. But if you look at the modernized stacks, container stacks, then you have the, well, the de facto standard, which is Docker, Docker containers. And uh, Docker runs as a process and it doesn't run on an independent version of the OS kernel. So if you have multiple Docker containers, they all use the same uh, operating system kernel. Um, but also, developing containers there was also the need of more security and when you look uh, at some other technologies there are a lot more but I now take the three most well known if you look at core OS the rocket container which uh, is now part of uh, Red Hat OpenShift it's already more secure but if you go any further then you have uh, an initiative uh, called Kata and Kata is in fact a container which is lightweight VM with all the benefits of a container and all the benefits of a virtual machine in, in terms of isolation, in terms of security. So if you look at the container stack, the Asian container stack, I already mentioned that the concept of containers were already there since the beginning of, um, of Unix. Back in 1997 already, uh, some uh, option existed, which is called ch uh, root, which is uh, an operation that changes apparent root directories for the current running processes and their children. So the program runs in an isolated, modified namespace environment, and it cannot access files and commands outside of that. So it's being isolated, actually. And some others which you have is uh, the system and the end spawn, um, which is more like an OS lightweight uh, namespace container. It's more or less a bit of the evolution of 
th root but more powerful because you also can have various kernel interfaces to the container uh, and set them only to read only uh, using a se linux uh, um, for that and you can isolate network interfaces and the system clock you can prohibit uh, uh, from out the container to change that so there's more and more um, isolation and when you go to uh, to more uh, evolution then you have your uh, linux containers which uh, also operates on a system level virtualization and running um, in this case also multiple isolated systems within a single control uh, host you don't have uh, a virtual machine with this but you can extend this with uh, uh, LXD with this uh, virtual machine implementation of it um, but you can use namespace and secret features with uh, from out the Linux kernel on the uh, on the uh, provided host which provides the LXD contain containers um, also Intel started initiative for uh, uh, containers uh, clear containers and kata containers are actually the benefit of clear containers and Hyper-V visors, uh, hypervisors uh, combined together uh, within this uh, project, which started around 2017. So, looking at this diagram, then you can see the difference between what containers are and what um, virtual machines are in in terms of um, running on a uh, or on, on a server if you look at the left part it's part of the virtual machine where you have uh, the host or the server with a core operating system uh, which holds the kernel um, you have an engine an hypervisor which translates the drivers um, uh, the guest operating systems using their own isolated applications in fact actually a guest host running on a um, server and you can do multiple host, uh, multiple guest uh, hosts, hosts uh, with different uh, operating systems, uh, which they don't know each other. So it's in fact uh, a complete data center. And on the right, you can see the container technology using the same structure: uh, uh, the host or the server, the operating system kernel, and container engine CLI, um, and on top of that, uh, running containers with an application configured and only the necessary uh, software uh, which the container needs so no overhead no uh, enormous footprints so containers can be lightweighted and don't have too much um, too much ballast with them so I already mentioned uh, about security um, so what's important, why is uh, security so important uh, for application container landscapes? Well, if you look at this flow, then you can see how uh, a typical development of an application uh, um, flow is, um, where container images are being stored and being uh, um, uh, pulled from um, and, and, and eventually uh, being deployed to a uh, environment which where I where they can run and all on these in these stages you have certain risks if you look at uh, a development of um, containers then you have um, building an image which can be risky you have uh, the registry so where you can um, store your container images can be uh, at risk then when you have a an orchestrator platform which uh, controls and manage your uh, container applications um, they can be at risks and also the host uh, where you um, uh, run the containers and the orchestrator uh, can be at risk at certain levels so what are these risks then so first of all if you look at the uh, image risk they uh, um, are actually uh, static archive files and they can include all the components to re uh, you run a given app uh, within an image and it can be they can sometimes miss critical updates because you store them in your um, in your uh, registry 
and they don't um, uh, uh, they are not applied with life cycle management uh, uh, infrastructure life cycle management such as security updates so an image can be outdated and um, free of uh, um, uh, full of uh, vulnerabilities of which you know not know of so when you have traditional operational patterns with deployed software then usually it gets updated while the system is running and you can update your system with the latest uh, security patches but when you have a container which is stored then it doesn't mean necessarily mean that it will do uh, that also so you have to be aware of that your container your image can be at risk missing all kinds of uh, life cycle action so be aware of it that you um, um, take care of that other things uh, within your image can be that you can package uh, 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 malicious software with it malware or package um, unencrypted uh, credentials text files with passwords all um, if you're not careful enough all packaged in that container so your image or your image or your image can be at great risk when you look at your uh, registry for instance um, well the same if you uh, 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 can be applied to, uh, to from your images uh, if you uh, if you store your images in your registry they can be become stale and when they become stale they can be uh, vulnerable with out-of-date versions so this is also a thing which you can you have to take care of um, this is because the uh, over time the set of images can store uh, many vulner vulnerabilities out-of-date versions and um, they do not have to pose a direct threat but uh, if you want to try them or use them again for deployment um, then you're going to deploy a vulnerable version if you don't update your image uh, using your uh, lifecycle management uh, flow, uh, flow other things uh, within your uh, um, um, images can be um, that you have insufficient uh, authentication or author authorization so you don't apply all the um, uh, policies for of your uh, uh, corporate um, sensitive, da sensitive data can be mixed together within uh, um, within your images so you have to be aware of um, you isolate on a software level um, um, but you also have to isolate on a functional level so don't put financial data within some other data so um, that can potentially lead to compromise of downstream containers and hosts now if you look at uh, orchestrators um, orchestrators which um, can manage all your uh, application containers then there are also uh, a lot of risks to to identify some of them there they won't will they won't apply to all of your uh, your entire landscape but you also have to take notice of it and be aware that it can happen so like unbounded administrative access so um, first when you historically many orchestrators were designed with the assumption that all users were, could interact with them and they all would be administrators but if you look at DevOps and especially DevSecOps then the roles within such a team are not only dev or only ops and not everyone is an ops and not everyone is a dev uh, so you need to build in uh, security in that pipeline and also in your uh, environments to uh, prevent someone doing actions which he or she shouldn't do uh, can be an intentionally can be uh, an accident but you can prevent it to set the uh, correct uh, permissions and correct access to to your containers and also unauthorized unauthorized access should be set for your orchestrator which means that you need to uh, s um, um, implement levels of security uh, role-based access which uh, like kubernetes has um, also your secrets sh should be 
uh, stored uh, in, a, in a safe way the best is not to use the default uh, mechanism of Kubernetes but use some other like Terraform fault or Helm uh, secrets which uh, um, can store your uh, secrets more secure than the default one um, so I already told about mixing workloads and sensitivities uh, different kinds of levels of sen sensitivity levels um, financial private um, but also if you scale your cluster your orchestrator cluster your kubernetes cluster be aware of that uh, that you prevent unauthorized hosts from joining the cluster so uh, uh, s set the proper um, uh, encryption levels uh, with uh, SSL and every tools you have uh, for your communications key pair for audit authentications set them uh, all across all your nodes in your cluster and don't leave them behind because these pose an image a risk or they pose a risk to your infrastructure also so these are all measurements you can think of uh, uh, up front uh, you design your entire landscape so and last but not least um, all your containers and you also your orchestrator runs on a server or a, um, a group of servers in your data center um, and when you look at that level then you have a large attack surface because your entire system can be exploited for uh, vulnerabilities by hackers uh, doing all kinds of attacks um, and also the shared kernel uh, uh, thing you have with containers that you can um, there is no isolation at the kernel level so if your kernel gets attacked then all the containers will be affected by it and of course uh, when you have virtual machines then the isolation is more high um, than by uh, container runtimes so all these vulnerabilities um, uh, should be uh, identified um, as well as also in here um, improper user access rights so give the proper permissions based on your company policy uh, and the roles uh, which should access the direct servers or hosts not everyone needs to be a system administrator um, but these are all basic security uh, rules which uh, can be applied in every on every uh, uh, landscape system landscape as you can see running a containerized landscape there are many risks to uh, identify um, and uh, I for now I want to focus on the host operating system where containers are running in their own namespace but still sharing the kernel of the host and that can lead to many uh, vulnerabilities and many threats to your uh, to your containers such as an attack on a host can be a large-scale attack for all your containers running on that host um, having improper user of authorities uh, host of file system falsifications all these uh, aspects can um, influence your container uh, security to overcome this security issue cut containers could be the right solution to clear this concern so as I mentioned there was a security risk for application containers due to the sharing uh, of uh, the Linux kernel but Kata containers have a different approach and they um, provide highly isolated containers likewise actually virtual machines over hypervisors and as you can see in these diagrams uh, it will show you the difference the left hand image shows a typical application container uh, based on docker or any other one and they share the same kernel uh, they're only uh, um, isolated with the namespace so it's a bit of a software isolation and on the other hand you have using uh, you can use Kata containers instead of a namespace and these are the ver small virtual machines which are created um, on the kernel and strongly uh, isolated so the technology of Kata containers is uh, based on KVM hypervisor and that's why the level of isolation is qu equivalent to hypervisor so for Kata you need a hypervisor if you're looking at 
a traditional container technology stack, traditional which is being used the last couple of years. Then you can see an overview here of what's being used and what the alternatives might be. Um, the types of uh, um, technology are like the engine for Docker, Docker D, uh, which you are run as, will run as a service as, as a daemon on your Linux system. Um, but an alternative could be Container D uh, or Cryo. Um, if you look at runtime, the traditional one is Run C, um, but you can replace them with Kata containers with the Kata runtime. Um, if you look at CLI. Um, a lot of uh, companies and a lot of projects use the Docker CLI, but you can replace it with uh, Podman, which is also more secure than the Docker CLI. And last but not least, if you want to build, uh, you can use the Docker build. You can also use Podman for that, but you can also uh, try another tool like Builda. So there are many alternatives at the moment in the market, and you have to pick the right one for your project. Um, and uh, yeah move on with it. There are a lot of benefits to run Kata containers. Kata containers are uh, highly compatible with uh, several technologies. You can uh, even run it uh, on your Docker engine. Um, so it's uh, highly compatible with Docker. Uh, but you can also choose um, uh, some other technologies and some other open source initi initiatives because it supports the OCI uh, standards and therefore it's also it's uh, compatible with your Kubernetes custom resource interfaces and it can run on uh, uh, other runtimes than only uh, the run C. You can use uh, Cryo as a runtime, Container D as a runtime or even FRACT, which is also a runtime uh, container interface. So you can see um, uh, Kata containers are, can be highly adopted uh, in, in the community to be used as the standard more secure container, more secure than Docker. Another great benefit of Kata is that you can run it container uh, daemonless. Um, if you look at Docker or container, then you can run it. Uh, if you install it, you will run it, have to run it and you have to run it as an as a daemon in, on your operating system. Uh, but using shim, you can run your containers daemonless, which means that uh, the container is started up and then the, con the container runtime immediately exits. So there's no daemon which is um, uh, monitoring the process because shim does that for you. And shim is uh, 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 an API for uh, launching runtime and handling container creations um, and also reporting status uh, and uh, handling IO and, uh, and log files for your uh, streaming containers and you can report uh, exit codes so uh, shim is actually meant to being replaced for daemon uh, uh, daemons which uh, container D and uh, docker D are so if you look also at the next version of uh, uh, the shim implemented for Kata shim version 2 then it's more simplified than the previous one because you have only one shim per container and uh, uh, or per pod and you don't have any proxies in between anymore uh, which you will see in the next uh, diagram in this diagram we zoom in on the Kata container architecture and if you look at the right hand side then you can see a Kata virtual machine and um, what, what, what you can see in here that the container namespace is in the Kata virtual machine itself so not on the host where traditional containers have their namespace running so you can see in here already the isolation of uh, a Kata virtual machine so Kata has a Kata runtime on the host which starts and configure these VM containers and for each container in the Kata VM there's a corresponding Kata shim on the host to communicate with clients like uh, kubectl uh, or docker uh, and all this communication goes to the shim over a gRPC protocol and the runtime for OCI command specifics and the specifics um, 
they also communicate to the client and backwards to the Kata virtual machine through the um, gRPC uh, protocol. In between you can see the Kata proxy which uh, was still uh, implemented uh, within version 1. In version 2 of Kata you don't need this Kata proxy anymore. So this means every pod will be accessed by a shim uh, um, from the Kata virtual machine. I already told um, Kata containers uh, implemented as virtual machines, they still need some type of a hypervisor. And uh, if you look at the typical hypervisors, which are well known, um, like Zen, like Hyper-V, like VMware ESX, um, they are in fact uh, hypervisors which uh, are, can be run on uh, hardware, uh, bare metal, with no operating system underneath it. Um, when you run Kata containers, then you also need a hypervisor, and the uh, implemented hypervisor for Kata containers is KVM. Um, KVM is also the hypervisor which Oracle now uses as a virtualization platform for uh, standard virtual machines, and it can also run as a type 1 hypervisor on a physical hardware. Um, but to run your containers as a virtual machine, you have to have some emulation. And this emulation uh, technology is uh, bundled in uh, software uh, called QEMU, uh, which is uh, compatible with KVM. And QEMU is being used by Oracle uh, to implement Kata containers. And you also have some other, uh, like Firecracker, uh, and Firecracker is run by uh, Amazon, AWS. Um, there, are n there are not many differences. Uh, there are, uh, of course, they are built different, but in the work they do the same. Uh, uh, but there are some small differences, like Q QEMU has some larger footprint than Firecracker, um, but Firecracker has um, less security, is more a bit less secure than QEMU. Uh, so the other uh, emulator, Firecracker, well, it's, uh, as I already said, it's ru it runs in uh, AWS uh, for uh, creating uh, micro virtual machines. Uh, it has a very f fast startup time and low memory overhead, so the footprint is compared to uh, QEMU is a bit smaller. Um, so it enables you to pack thousands of micro VMs on your uh, machine, so every function, every container, container group can be encapsulated within a virtual machine barrier um, to enable workloads for different customers to run on the same machine and still have this uh, isolation and Firecracker is in fact an alternative for key QEMU um, but, uh, but uh, as I already said uh, it's it's less secure because um, yeah uh, uh, you have to share some some uh, metadata um, uh, b uh, across all these uh, micro VMs. So there's a sharing component within um, within Firecracker. Implementing um, virtualization using uh, QEMU, you have to be aware of that uh, it needs to be enabled on your CPU level. So you have to check with this uh, command if your CPU is compatible with uh, virtualization. These uh, flags are set in uh, CPU info and you can check them with a simple grab command. Um, if it's not there, then you can check your BIOS if it's possible, but um, it can be that your uh, processor doesn't support uh, virtualization. If that's the case, then you can run uh, this uh, emulation for your virtual machines. So be aware of this is one of the prerequisites to run uh, uh, cotton container emulated virtual machines. Oracle uh, implements Kata on their cloud, on the Oracle container runtime, um, and it's uh, generally available now. And uh, well, Kata container is a um, mutual project from Intel uh, clear containers uh, using Hyper Run V 
as a hypervisor uh, and using QEMU as the virtualization technology, sorry, the emulation technology for running the VM. So you have lightweight virtual machines. They still feel and perform like containers, um, but they still have this type of isolation which you uh, require as a security measurement. Um, as already said, it runs KP KVM hypervisor on Oracle Linux 7 and higher with the kernel 5 implementation. Zooming on specific Oracle, um, it is supported for Oracle Cloud. Oracle supports Kata containers and also the additional tool sets for uh, using Kata containers like Podman, Bilden, Bilda, Scopio. Um, it also uh, is supported for uh, Oracle's application server in the cloud, Oracle Web Logic. Um, but it's still open source, so it's, it can be used also for non Oracle products. Um, like uh, Amazon uses it for uh, uh, AWS, for instance. Um, but it's it, it's uh, supported. So so if you look at uh, Kata Cryo and the Oracle Cloud infrastructure, this is my recipe which I used to build a Kata Kubernetes cluster. So what I needed was a cloud compartment, which I already had um, three uh, regions, three. Uh, availability domains um, and I've used uh, three virtual machine instances just plain Linux uh, compute uh, instances to run my Kubernetes cluster on. Oracle also has its own uh, uh, managed uh, Kubernetes cluster uh, uh, Oracle Kubernetes engine but uh, the Kubernetes engine which you can uh, uh, get from Oracle itself it doesn't support uh, Kata containers yet. So you can't set it up using OKE, Oracle Container Engine, a uh, Kubernetes engine. Um, but as I told, I used the computer uh, infrastructure for that. Uh, and these instances were running on the Oracle Linux 7 uh, developer image to uh, have the uh, proper tool set um, to uh, uh, install Kata container and Kata runtime and also uh, container D and cryo and uh, co uh, container runtime interfaces which I uh, needed. And with these simple commands I uh, started my Kata cryo integration. So connect to the proper YUM repositories if they weren't there yet. So connect to the default Google uh, Kubernetes um, repository to get the latest version of uh, Kubernetes. Um, because the Oracle YUM doesn't uh, support the latest versions uh, 18, for instance, but for my purpose I used uh, 115 uh, for the latest. Um, so I used uh, some developer tools for the uh, for uh, from out the Oracle YUM repository and KVM utilities for the KMU uh, virtualization and emulation. And then I installed some extra uh, some dependencies for um, Kata, so installed the Kata runtime. When building my Kata container uh, cluster, I first started to integrate it within Docker, so I wanted to have control with systemd uh, to start up the Docker daemon um, and created a uh, an extra entry in my daemon to s tell about uh, the storage driver to be used uh, to use the overlay to uh, storage driver for that and uh, for the startup I um, uh, implemented the Kata runtime at for the docker daemon to tell the docker daemon that the runtime default runtime would be the Kata runtime instead of the docker runtime and uh, at the end I also installed the CRI command line utility for CRI compatible container runtimes for running it with Kubernetes. So when I was ready with all the prerequisites I um, started to do the Kubernetes integration. So 
integrate Kata containers into my Kubernetes cluster. Um, I started with a very simple setup. If you look at this diagram, then you can see um, the master and two worker nodes for your for my Kubernetes cluster, and the container engine, the container runtime software, which I wanted to be used. So the container engine software first I started using a Docker software, and later it became Containerd and Cryo with Kata runtime. So the master server. Uh, uh, was set up using an API server, scheduler, the controller, etcd to hold all, all the cluster uh, configurations, uh, just the basics of a Kubernetes cluster, and the work nodes were instructed by the kubelet and a kube proxy to start up and uh, managing the life cycles of all the app containers within these pods. So if, 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 uh, as you can see, this is a very basic setup. It's not high available. I had one master. You, you can set up multiple masters for your Kubernetes cluster if you want to do um, um, high availability. Uh, what I did is was an existing cluster. I took, uh, my approach was to took off uh, node by node and implement the new container runtime interface on the work node and then join the the uh, node again back to the uh, Kubernetes cluster. And this resulted in these uh, kubelet and container runtime engines. Uh, I uh, set up several runtimes to run in my Kubernetes cluster. First of all, I uh, started just with Docker. Uh, the kubelet uh, uh, spoke to the Docker uh, uh, daemon and uh, through RunC it started some uh, app containers. Later on I switched over to container D, uh, also making use of the RunC um, container runtime to start up these containers. Um, but next I um, started using um, container D and Cryo for Kata containers uh, to start up uh, some app containers using a virtual image from um, key EMU. So, in fact, uh, the right setup was the setup which is being used, uh, was being used as a Kata virtual machines. Now, integrating Kata containers in Kubernetes, I needed to do some extra steps to accomplish this. Um, so, I had to install the right packages to be used by Kubernetes. I had to instruct the kubelet to use the proper container runtime or the container runtime which I wished it would be used. Um, you can rebuild the Kubernetes master, but you also can say, well, I don't want to do that. But in my case, I did because I wanted to uh, the Kubernetes master to run the container D and um, the worker nodes I would be running with uh, Cryo uh, using their own uh, container runtime. So looking at that, um, one of the worker nodes was using Cryo Runtime, as I already told you. Um, so I had to configure that uh, to use it instead of the Docker default runtime. So what I did is um, made an extra configuration file for the kubelet service and told the kubelet service that you would that it would have to run with the Cryo Runtime. And these are the commands to do that. Um, and afterwards, I also uh, told the master, I uh, removed the master and uh, said to the master that it would be running with container D. And uh, as you can see, um, it has to have a swap uh, on disabled because otherwise the kubelet won't start. You get a failure, you get an error. Um, so you need to be aware of uh, to um, run the command swap off or uh, uh, set it system wide so if a, a reboot uh, appears then uh, you won't have to set it up again. A little bit focus on the master preparation where I already said it, I was using container D. Um, the same here, make an extra entry for your kubelet service to say to the kubelet service that you want to run container D socket. Um, I also had to uh, change the CCube driver in the kubelet uh, with the kubelet extra argument to say that the CCube group driver will be system D. And the end result was this actually. Um, you can see 
um, in this overview I, I told you about the master was running, running container D but in this overview I configured one of the workers to use container D as the container runtime and uh, with a cute cuddle uh, of the nodes you can see the container runtimes in the right uh, table um, and they all using the, the uh, something else you also can configure docker D as the container runtime on one of those if you require that so they can go is coexist uh, all uh, together and that's the neat thing of it it's it's, it's really wonderful and here an overview of the, the shopping list I had to build it. Um, three VM instances in the Oracle Cloud Infrastructure, just compute instances. But it can be any, you can do it in Azure, you can do it in, um, in the, uh, Amazon or Google. Uh, a lot of uh, Linux uh, distributions are uh, compatible with it. CentOS, uh, Ubuntu, doesn't matter actually. Um, but for me, as with my Oracle background, I used uh, uh, the Oracle Linux uh, version. Um, you also need to install the KVM uti utilities. Uh, I had to install uh, the developer release to enable all those KVM utilities. And uh, subsequent uh, to that, I had to install Kata Runtime Cryo, the container runtime interface, and container D. But with that, you're not finished yet. You need to enable the Kata runtime on your Kubernetes cluster. And you do that by uh, implementing a Kata runtime class, which can make use of the key, uh, EMU hypervisor. Furthermore, you need to do some labeling to say to uh, a node to uh, act as a Kata runtime host, a Kata runtime node, and you have to instruct your pod to use the Kata runtime class. And you have to label nodes, as already told, to schedule pods for Kata runtime. You can also do it with an untrusted workload, so leave the class uh, out of it, but I wanted to implement the Kata runtime class for that. And this is the command which I used to label a node uh, to be able to run Kata containers, uh, so label the node with the Kata runtime class so you can also um, put that in your YAML file um, with a node selector which I will show you some later and here you can see uh, some of these working nodes have a label Kata runtime true uh, in here so every uh, part you uh, which is scheduled will be, will be scheduled in, uh, on one of these nodes now here I have a deployment YAML file of a simple uh, PHP Apache application which uh, will be running uh, cut in a Kata virtual machine. So you had to apply this uh, runtime class uh, in your spec uh, section to be using the Kata runtime class. And when the pod was started, then you it would it was running on worker note uh, two in my uh, case, and then you could s uh, see with this specific command uh, that key emu is uh, started and running this uh, this container. So that's a proof that it's working. Um, I now have a short demo uh, to run an Oracle database on a Kata container, and what I needed uh, for this uh, demo, I needed a namespace, I needed a secret for pulling the image. I need an Oracle database image, I need a YAML file, and I need to run a Kata uh, on an, and also a non Kata container. So I uh, will start this demo uh, shortly. Okay, now in this uh, short demo I prepared, I have two YAML files for an Oracle database. So if you look at it, I created a YAML file for. A database running on Kata and a database running on non Kata, and uh, I both scheduled them on worker node 2. So if you look at um, the Kata, then you can see in here I have this runtime class Kata key EMU, Q EMU, sorry for that, and um, I have labeled uh, um, no, there's no node selector, so it will run. Um, 
to the broken note, which is labeled with the kata runtime class. And uh, the other one is a YAML file, uh, uh, not using kata containers, so it's a standard one. And it pulls the image from Docker uh, and will uh, install it as a part on the Kubernetes cluster. So if I look at my um, Kubernetes cluster at the moment, it's, it's empty, it's only running the basic uh, administrator stuff. So I create a deployment with the uh, Kubernetes uh, Oracle database YAML file um, without a uh, kata. So I can, you can see the difference. Um, do it create minus F. Uh, sorry for that. Non kata. So it will a uh, create a um, database. So you can see in here the database running the part uh, at, at the bottom and um, yeah you can access this uh, uh, container by uh, uh, execute a runtime for it and uh, launch a SQL plus or whatever you uh, require. Now the pod is running in here but if you want to see if the uh, QEMU virtualization is running. Well, it's not because there is no uh, Kata container deployed. So, as you can see here, there's no process uh, container process started up using this uh, uh, emulation for uh, this Kata container. So, now to prove that um, you can run an Oracle database uh, using uh, Kata containers, then um, I need to create a pod, um, a deployment for an Oracle database with. Uh, the Kata runtime class and I have prepared a YAML file in here which I've already showed you so I will create this deployment for um, Kata to run the database on it so I'll do a create minus F for this YAML file and in my command history so I will deploy this one throw an extra servers and then an extension will be created and the pod will um, be created so it's not pending because it will uh, create a container for uh, the database so as you can see it's now um, um, creating the container at the moment now you can see the um, database is created uh, the kata database and if you look at uh, the working out now you can see uh, QEMU is started with this uh, container database container so that means that it runs in its own virtual machine and you can access it still as uh, usual as any other container but you can see now this database is running on a Kata virtual machine so that's the proof it's uh, it, it's working and uh, well to uh, to conclude uh, this um, you can run use multiple runtimes using either our uh, cryo or uh, docker d or doc container d uh, it's all compatible with kubernetes so that's really an amazing thing i hope you enjoyed my session um, if you have any questions you can ask them through the facilities of uh, stackcon um, uh, later on you can approach me uh, by the socials which i will um, leave behind it's also in my profile i guess so I hope you enjoyed my uh, session and well, uh, stay tuned and uh, maybe we see each other uh, somewhere at a conference uh, in real life in the future.